Welcome to physics. Uh, first, we want to talk about what physics is. Is it the study of objects in motion? Is it the study of galaxies and space? Is it the study of atoms? It turns out it's really uh, all of that and more. Uh, physics is really the study of any uh, object and how it interacts with other objects around it. So it's really a, a very, very broad subject area. And so the idea is to take all these different interactions between all these different things and do our best to describe them. And that's what physics is. Something we want to take care of right away that's a, a big hang-up in science and, and something that you know, maybe is a little bit different in the science classroom than it is in the regular world is the difference between a theory and a law. Um, a lot of the times we're taught that you know, it's something as we start to figure something out through the scientific process, we start to develop theories, uh, and that these theories eventually turn into laws, which, you know, are ultimately correct and can never be proven wrong. Uh, but that's not the case. It turns out both a law and theory can be proven wrong with the right evidence, uh, though these are usually very, very solid things. Both theories and laws uh, exist and have existed sometimes for over 100 years and stood up uh, to all of the evidence uh, that's ever we've ever found since they were created and still exist. Um, so they're both very, very strong. Uh, the main difference is that a theory attempts to explain why something happens, and a law attempts to explain what happens. And that's the big difference between a law and a theory. So let's try and think of some examples here to, to illustrate what we're talking about. Uh, a law, for example, you know, maybe a, a law we've heard of would be uh, Newton's law of gravity. It attempts to explain what happens uh, when an object is under the influence of a, a gravitational force. So it attempts to explain a, a behavior of an object. Uh, whereas maybe a theory of gravity would explain why. So something along the lines of theory of general relativity would attempt to explain why gravity works the way it does and why interact, objects interact the way they do on very big scales. Another example maybe, a uh, theory of evolution attempts to explain why uh, individual species look the way they do, why they have the characteristics they do, uh, and, and why uh, they have evolved in the way that they have. Something we'll get into a lot uh, in this unit, in this class even, uh, will be Newton's laws of motion. He has three laws of motion that attempt to explain what happens to objects that are in motion, uh, especially when they are accelerating. So that's kind of the difference between a theory and a law. Both represent kind of the same thing as far as how strong they are scientifically, uh, but a theory attempts to explain why something happens, a law what happens. When we talk about physical quantities, uh, what we're really talking about is what kind of units we'll use in this class. Uh, of course, we're going to use metric units, okay, just like we have in all science classes uh, up to this point in your life, I hope. Uh, and then, specifically within the metric system, three letters that will help you out a lot in this class, if you can remember them, are MKS. MKS are an abbreviation for the base units that we have in this class. Uh, those base units are meters kilograms, and seconds. So anytime we have a length, it's going to be in meters, a mass in kilograms, a time in seconds. Uh, there's a couple other ones that we'll get to later that deal with electrical charge, but for the most part, these are the three that you need to remember. All other units that we use are actually what we call derived units. Okay, This means that they're made up of some combination of these three things. For example, the unit for force is a newton abbreviated with a capital N. A newton is actually equivalent to a kilogram meter per second squared. So even though it's a, a unit on its own, a newton, it's actually made up of some combination of our MKS units. Uh, and that's what we call a derived unit. So everything that we work with, meters, kilograms, and seconds, this is very important. When you start to work equations, you need to make sure that all your units are in meters, kilograms, seconds. If they're not, you need to convert. So before we get into uh, unit conversions, we first need to know our metric prefixes um, very well. Uh, we're going to have to use these all year long. Uh, you need to know them well. Uh, so we're going to start sort of at the bottom here. So we start with our base unit, whatever that might be. It could be meters, maybe, in this example. Uh, below that would be our prefix deci, then centi, then milli, then micro, then nano, and then maybe pico, 
and femto. Uh, those would be our base units, and we'll talk about those a little bit so we really uh, get those down. Because it's the metric unit, uh, metric system, we do everything in powers of 10. Uh, so our base unit would actually be 10 to the 0, remember, which is equivalent to 1. So that's just whatever it is. Uh, so maybe it's just plain old meters. Deci would be 10 to the negative 1, so it's a tenth of a meter. The abbreviation dm, so there's 10 decimeters in a meter. Centi, 10 to the negative 2, abbreviate that cm. Milli, 10 to the negative 3, so a thousandth of a meter. Abbreviated maybe millimeters, so the lowercase m. Uh, micro, if we're following our pattern, we might expect that that's 10 to the negative 4, uh, but it, when we get down this low, we actually go by powers of 1,000. So it's going to be 1,000 smaller than milli, so 10 to the negative 6th. Uh, and we abbreviate that, since we already used m, we actually use the Greek letter m, or mu, which looks something like that. So micrometers, 10 to the negative 6th. Nano, 10 to the negative 9th. So nanometers, pico, 10 to the negative 12th, or pm, and then we lost our femto here, femto 10 to the negative 15th, or fm. Now, uh, what do you need to know? Mostly, if you can know down to micro, you'll be pretty good for this class. Occasionally, we might use smaller than that, uh, but hopefully we'll have a chance to remind ourselves of what those are. But you should know very well deci, centi, milli, and micro. On the upper side of things we have our base unit and then going above that um, there's a, a couple that are you know 10, 100, things like that but we're not going to use those very often so we're going to skip straight to kilo. Above kilo would be mega, above mega would be giga, above giga would be tera and that's really all we'll need to know on the upper side of things. So our powers of 10 for this, again, our base would be 10 to the 0, just like it was before. Kilo 10 to the 3, so a 1,000 of our base unit. So if our base unit was a meter, a 1,000 meters would be a, make up a kilometer. Mega 10 to the 6, so we're going by powers of a 1,000 already. Capital M, lowercase m for megameters, or 10 to the 6 meters. Giga 10 to the 9th, or a billion of our base units. Okay, So like a gigameter. Uh, tera. 10 to the 12th, or terameters. Uh, and those, um, you know, probably, again, you won't need to know all of those right off the top of your head, uh, but definitely know kilo, mega, and giga, uh, and then tera if we need to, we can reference that later. So the next thing we want to talk about is unit conversions. Uh, unit conversions are going to be really important. Remember I mentioned earlier that we have to be in MKS units when we're doing all of our equations and any uh, math work that we do. Uh, so if it's not in one of those, then we have to do some unit conversion. Um, so the best way to do this is maybe to give an example. Um, so we're going to say 10 millimeters, and I want to convert that to, let's say, kilometers. Now this is a, a pretty simple example that some of us could probably do in our heads just by knowing how many powers of 10 different they are, but I want to use it to illustrate the process here. Um, two different methods here. Uh, first method called the train tracks method. So we could say 10 millimeters, and we start to make our train tracks here. So it looks something like that. And then we're going to put conversion factors in the middle here. So first thing I'm going to try and do is get to my base unit. Uh, my base unit would be a meter. So I'm going to put meters on top, millimeters on bottom. Top cancels out with bottom. That's how I know I'm doing this correctly. Uh, and I know that there are a thousand millimeters in one meter because of how my uh, prefixes work. And then I also know that there are a thousand meters in one kilometer. So meters, meters cancel out. And then we multiply everything across the top and keep my unit with it. So I have 10 kilometers divided by a thousand times a thousand, so a thousand squared, if you want to write it that way. So 10 divided by a thousand twice moves our decimal place over three times and then three times again. So if you write that as a decimal, that's 0 0.00001 kilometers. So 10 millimeters is equivalent to 0 0.00001 kilometers. The other way we can do that is by uh, doing it with fractions. So we could say 10 millimeters times 1 meter over 1,000 millimeters. So we write our, our uh, conversion factors as fractions. So 
which would be millimeters. And it's the same kind of process, making sure top cancels out with bottom. One kilometer over a thousand meters, meters disappear. Uh, and we get the exact same answer either way. Uh, it is your preference as to which way you decide to use. Uh, personally, I like the train tracks method. I think it's a little more organized, a little neater. Uh, but if you prefer working with fractions, you're more than welcome to. Both get you to the same answer. So let's just try a, a slightly harder example here. Uh, I want to convert uh, 3.2 miles into kilometers. Uh, and we're going to use the fact that 2.54 centimeters is equivalent to 1 inch. So that's our English system to metric conversion there. So uh, a much harder problem here, um, especially given our conversion factor. So let's see what we can do with this. So I'm going to use train tracks. Like I said, that's the way I prefer. Uh, but you are more than welcome to try and use the uh, fractions method as well here. So 3.2 miles. First thing I need to do in order to use my conversion factor is get these miles down to inches here for my conversion factor. So uh, miles down to inches, first thing I can do is get miles to feet. And I know there are 5,280 feet in one mile. So miles are going to cancel out. And then I know that there are 12 inches in one foot feet on the bottom so that they cancel out. And then I can use my conversion factors because now I have inches here and so I can get myself into the metric system which is good because then things will be nice and easy from there. So I know that in one inch, inches on the bottom again so that they cancel out is equal to 2.54 centimeters. Then I know there are 100 centimeters in one meter. So I'm getting there. And to get to kilometers, ask ourselves how many meters in a kilometer. Well, there's a thousand meters in one kilometer. Those cancel out. Put my equal sign down here so that we have a little bit of room. Multiply everything by the top, across the top. And that gives me 514,990. Erase that real quick. That should be a nine. 0.08 divided by uh, across the bottom 100 times 1,000 is going to give me 100,000 3 the unit we were left with on the top was kilometers so if I take 514,990.8 divided by 100,000 we get 5.15 kilometers as our final answer. Uh, which shouldn't come as a surprise to you. If you've done any running at all, you know that uh, a 5K is about 3.2 miles. So now we need to talk a little bit about accuracy and precision. Uh, the best way to think about accuracy and precision is to think of a target. Okay, so let's get a target up here. Here's our target and we'll think about accuracy versus precision. Uh, accuracy uh, is when we have our results and those results come very, very close to our expected answer. So if we get a couple of results in our lab, we think about one there, one there, and one there. That's great. That's a very accurate answer because it's very close uh, to the expected answer. So if we think of the center of the target as being our expected answer, if things are close, then we're accurate. To think about precision, uh, we could maybe do this, where instead of our arrows being right there in the dead center, maybe they're off over here. But they're all very close together. So precision means regardless of how close we are to the actual center, our results are all nice and neat and next to each other. Um, so that would indicate if we were doing a lab and we are doing multiple trials, uh, that would mean that maybe we did the same error every single time because we we're off of our expected answer by a similar amount. So it would be important for us to go back and look for errors in that lab. Uh, we, in this situation, we could actually say that we were both accurate and precise uh, because we were close to our actual target and all of our results 
were precise, they were close together. This is kind of the ideal situation when we're doing a lab. We're looking for this. Uh, but this is okay too, as long as we're able to explain why there's this gap here. Why are we off by that little bit every time? Uh, and then we could go back and modify the lab if needed. The thing we really want to avoid uh, that's tricky is if we have something maybe like this. This would be a situation where we are neither accurate nor precise. Uh, so that means none of my three choices here were close to the center. They weren't close to our expected value. And they were all far apart from each other, so they weren't precise either. This means that uh, something has gone seriously wrong and we should consider redoing the lab. Or uh, the probably not as likely possibility is that whatever theory that we're working with, whatever mathematical model we're working with, uh, is completely wrong and doesn't represent that situation at all. So ideally, in a lab situation, what we're looking for uh, is both accurate and precise. Okay? We get our expected values in physics uh, from mathematical models, which we're going to go into a lot in this first chapter. Uh, so we're going to use math, come up with predictions. For example, we might come up with a prediction for uh, how far is an object going to go if we throw it with a certain speed at a certain angle. When that happens, uh, we'll put it into our math, we'll get a number, and then we can go test it and say, well, how close was our mathematical model to what's, what actually is? So those are some important things to keep in mind uh, when we go uh, on from here, uh, when we go to do labs and work on our mathematical models.